In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. I welcome you here this morning to St. Patrick's Cathedral as we come to celebrate the Eucharist on this, the fifth Sunday in ordinary time. We gather as a community of the baptised once again to sit under the Lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is proclaimed in word and whom we meet in sacramental communion. I especially welcome those who are joining us by virtue of the live streaming of this Mass today. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
us pray. Keep your family safe, O Lord, with unfailing care, that relying solely on the hope of heavenly grace, they may be defended always by your protection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on a high throne. His train filled the sanctuary above him. It stood seraphs, each one with six wings. And they cried out to one on this, another in this way, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. His glory fills the whole earth. The foundations of the threshold shook with the voice of the one who cried out, and the temple was filled with smoke. I said, what a wretched state I am in. I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have looked at the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the altar with a pair of thongs. With this, he touched my mouth and said, See now, this has touched your lips. Your sin is taken away. Your iniquity is purged. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will be my, our messenger? I answered, Here I am. Send me. The word of the Lord.
reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, the gospel that you received and in which you are firmly established because the gospel will save you only if you keep believing exactly what I preach to you. Believing anything else will not lead to anything. Well then, in the first place, I taught you what I had been taught myself, namely that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared first to Cephas and secondly to the 12. Next, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me too. It was as though I was born when no one expected it. I am the least of the apostles. In fact, since I persecuted the church of God, I hardly deserve the name apostle. But by God's grace, that is what I am. And the grace that he gave me has not been fruitless. On the contrary, I, or rather, the grace of God that is with me, have worked harder than any of the others. But what matters is that I preach what they preach, and this is what you all believed. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. And your A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus was standing one day by the lake of Gennesaret with the crowd pressing round him, listening to the word of God, when he caught sight of two boats close to the bank. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, it was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and pay out your nets for a catch. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but if you say so, I will pay out the nets. And when they had done this, they netted such a huge number of fish that their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their companions in the other boats to come and help them. When these came, they filled the two boats to sinking point. 
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus, saying, Leave me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were completely overcome by the catch they had made. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were Simon's partners. But Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on it is men you will catch. Then bringing their boats back to land, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. It would be very unusual if you went through the course of your life without actually being subject at some time to an interview. When we think about interviews, we normally think in terms of applying for employment. And then the process normally is that you fill in an application and uh, you then try and present yourself as comprehensively as you can to your potential employer in the sense that you're the best person for the position. And then, of course, an interview seems to be part and parcel of the process. But, of course, as we well know, there are all sorts of other interviews as well. Employment is one. Those of you who are parents who have enrolled your children in schools will know that having an interview uh, with the school principal is also part and parcel of the process. And then from time to time, people who have expertise or might be famous for some reason or another might be interviewed on television or they might be interviewed on radio. But more commonly, the practice of interviewing takes place in respect to employment. And you will know that if you've ever gone through that interview process, you will understand that when you get called to an interview, you try and present yourself as best as you possibly can. You try and build up your confidence before you go for the interview, and then you try and be as convincing as you can possibly be. The problem is, of course, that most of us have a little inbuilt mechanism in us. It's hard to know where that mechanism comes from, but the default position often is that we're not really quite as convinced about our capacity as what we actually try and say that we think we are. And often you will know that when you come out of an interview process, you probably then go through some sort of forensic analysis of the way that you presented yourself, and more often than not, you might say, oh, well, I could have answered it this way or I could have answered it that way and maybe perhaps I wasn't as comprehensive as I thought that I was going to be. Where does that come from? It's hard to know. Some people who look at developmental psychology say that negative messaging when we're very young children basically implants itself in our psychology and so we're always inclined to turn on ourselves when we feel that we're under some degree of pressure. Maybe that's so. Certainly it seems to be a facet of the human personality. Today, we are confronted in the gospel with Jesus in a very unconventional way, enlisting those early disciples who are going to be a very fundamental part of his team. But he does so in a very different and unique way, which is so characteristic of Jesus, who simply doesn't follow the usual conventions. Luke presents for us a very unique picture of the way in which those first disciples were called. We can be certain then that when we come to look at Luke's version of the calling of the disciples, as is so characteristic with Luke, He's looking forward as he looks backward. I'll get to that. You see, we can be fairly certain, at least according to Luke's version, that Peter, Simon Peter, already had some knowledge of Jesus. After all, Jesus had been conducting the early part of his mission around the Sea of Galilee, or Gennesaret as it's sometimes referred to, 
And we know that probably James and John, the brothers of Zebedee, who were in partnership with, with Simon Peter, uh, also at least had some knowledge of Jesus. So they were not surprised that he'd set himself up in preaching now to a large crowd of people gathered by the lake. We also shouldn't be surprised that Jesus elects to do so from the boat and asks Peter to put a little bit out from the shore. Why? Because water is a natural reflector of sound. And while in a building like this we have uh, a sound that is amplified through a PA system, at the time of Jesus there was no such thing. And if the crowd was really busy, big, then Jesus naturally would want to be able to use the natural elements in order to be able, I guess, to be heard. So water acts as a natural uh, sort of conductor for audible sound. But what happens then is very strange indeed because when Jesus finished speaking, he then challenges Peter to go back to fishing. They've caught nothing, but he asked Peter to go back out, he says, to the deep. Notice that Peter, in response to Jesus' request, says, Master, we toiled all night and we got nothing, but if you say so, we'll go back. And then something extraordinary happens. They are confronted with a divine encounter through a provision of so much fish that it's almost overwhelming. And what happens then? Notice Peter drops master and then refers to Jesus as Lord. There's been a fundamental shift in Peter's understanding of who Jesus is. He's no longer just the teacher, but there is someone far more profound here than just the teacher. It is Jesus acknowledged as Lord, which is the same thing as saying Jesus is God. But also note that Peter then goes back to the default position, which is, I'm not worthy, I'm not up to this. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, he says. Notice that Jesus doesn't address that issue. He sees beyond that. What he sees is the potential that Peter has to be a disciple. And he says, don't be afraid. This phrase we hear so often throughout biblical literature, when confronted by a divine reality, don't be afraid. The same words that the archangel Gabriel said to Mary when he told her that she was to be the mother of God. Don't be afraid. Jesus says the same thing. Don't be afraid because from now on you are going to catch people and bring them into the life of the kingdom just in the same way that I have called you. The calling by God of those whom he chooses will come in all sorts of various and different ways. It was certainly true for St Paul, as he alludes to in the passage from the first letter to the Corinthians today, when he says, I'm the least of the apostles. I was persecuting the church and then through God's grace, I became what I am as an apostle, the least of the apostles. Therefore, his own calling, of course, was unconventional, as indeed is the case of Isaiah in our first reading today, where he saw the vision of heaven. And again, what does Isaiah do? He goes back to the default human position. I am a sinful man, a man of unclean lips. 
I am not worthy, he says. But God has other ideas for Isaiah and he sends the angel to get a coal from the altar to touch the lips of Isaiah and then he is ready to respond to the divine call. Here I am, send me. In the celebration of the Mass, there are two ritual high points that we celebrate every week. The first of those high points is the proclamation of the Gospel, hearing the words of Jesus himself. The second high point is our sacramental encounter at the altar when we receive Christ in the Blessed Sacrament to nourish us for the journey of our lives. As Catholics, we have a ritual moment when the Gospel is announced and before we hear the proclamation of the words of Jesus, an action that all of you are very familiar with. And that action is that as we greet the Gospel, we make the sign of the cross three times on our forehead, on our lips, and on our heart. In other words, I would like to suggest to you that that equates, in a sense, to the same action of the angel taking the coal from the altar in the vision of Isaiah and touching his lips, making him ready to respond to God's call. And we too, by making that triple sign of the cross, are saying that we also are ready to respond to God's call to be purveyors of the gospel in the way in which we live out our Christian conviction day by day and week by week. In effect, what we are doing is that we're saying, like those early disciples, that we are ready to follow in the way of Jesus Christ and to be the ones who will carry the light and truth of the gospel into the world in which we live. It is nothing less than saying, here am I, send me. And that is the call of authentic discipleship. What we must now do, therefore, having been touched by the word of God in the proclamation of the gospel, preparing ourselves to be nourished from the table of life, we go back out into the world in which we live in order to display God's love, God's justice, God's truth to all those that we encounter. Let us stand now to profess the faith of the Church in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Christ crucified and risen intercedes for us with the Father. Let us therefore offer our prayer with great confidence. That all who preach God's word will express with conviction and clarity that Christ has died, is risen, and will return. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That God may strengthen many to answer his call to serve as priests, deacons, and religious brothers and sisters. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That Deacon Matthew Dimion will be blessed in his ministry here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. May he know God's presence through the prayers and encouragement of this community of faith and be affirmed in his chosen vocation on his journey to priesthood. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who research, teach, and publish God's word in our world will, through their work, help more people to know, love, and serve the Lord. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer that by seeing God's presence more clearly in every human life, we may repent of the ways that we have failed to honour, protect, and welcome that life. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who are sick may find healing and comfort for their family and friends. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear our prayer. That all who have died may be purified of sin and rejoice in eternal life. Lord, hear us. Lord, hear us. Eternal God, despite our unworthiness, you call us to follow you. As you hear our prayers, make us faithful in responding to your call. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
Pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. our God, who once established these created things to sustain us in our frailty, grant, we pray, that they may become for us now the sacrament of eternal life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For by his birth he brought renewal to humanity's fallen state, and by his suffering cancelled out our sins. By his rising from the dead he has opened the way to eternal life, and by ascending to you, O Father, he has unlocked the gates of heaven. And so with the company of angels and saints, we sing the hymn of your praise, as without end we acclaim. Indeed, holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise, for through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O 
O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognising the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Patrick and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Vincent, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you, in your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Receptis salutari vos moniti et divina institutione formati ademus dicere. Pate noster, ries in celis, sanctifice tu nomen tu, ad veniet regnum tu, fiat Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
let us pray. O God, who have willed that we be partakers in the one bread and the one chalice, grant us, we pray, so to live, that made one in Christ, we may joyfully bear fruit for the salvation of the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just a few brief announcements. Last night at Holy Family Church in Ludnam, uh, Deacon Matthew Dimian was ordained. A very lovely celebration uh, with the community there at Ludnam, and uh, he will take up his position here, as was announced last week, as a deacon assisting in the cathedral parish from tomorrow. So please welcome. Uh, Deacon Matthew, as uh, he will be here next weekend at all the masses, so please make him yourselves known to him. The Cathedral Gift Shop is open uh, back to its usual hours today, and also uh, if you're going to submit articles to St Pat's Matters, please uh, make certain that you give those to Marian Polizzi as soon as possible. Paper copies of the National Church Life Survey will be available next weekend. Please take one home with you and return them. They're very useful to the church in forward planning, uh, particularly in terms of the devising of pastoral plans. As you know, COVID has had an effect on many of our parishioners who've been reluctant to come out of their homes. And if you know somebody who might uh, benefit from a visit of one of the cathedral clergy, please contact the parish office and let them know. The Cloister Cafe is reopened, and so that means morning tea is available after this Mass today. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before the Mass is ended.